Well, thank you very much, um, everybody, uh, for being here. And I hope you found the discussion so far um, interesting. When Richard Ings gets up to speak, my heart rate always goes up. Um, That's okay. We can test for that. <laughs> yes, test for that. <laughs> I'm sure you can. I'm not willing to subject myself to it. Um, but so many of the issues raised um, just show the complication of this whole drug testing in sport and, and where sport is heading and the whole idea that athletes are subjected to an environment which is completely different to a, a legal environment, if you like, that the rest of us get to enjoy. Um, earlier this year, Ben Johnson was out here and he was probably the most famous, you know, in living memory case of someone who failed a drugs test. And I was actually appalled that when he got here, he was introduced for every single media interview he did or every public um, guest speaking function that he attended as disgraced athlete Ben Johnson. And when you were talking, Richard, about you know, the, um, the ramifications um, being proportional to the, the crime that has been committed, and remember, we're not talking about crimes here generally, um, it just seems so unfair that a, a human life is actually cut off at the knees. He cannot do anything or go anywhere in the world without being recognised as a disgrace. And I just wonder where that's taking us. And it's only got to that point because sport is held up on such high ideals and you might even go so far as to say mythical ideals. There's no such thing as a level playing field. It doesn't matter how we try and create one or, or work one, it does not exist. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let's tackle these issues. And I'm aware of the fact that you didn't get to ask questions um, so much through the presentations and there's a lot of questions out there. So we're really going to make this um, mostly open to you. But there are a couple of things that each of the speakers mentioned to me that they did want to um, talk about. We haven't heard from Patsy yet, but Patsy, with her um, psychological perspective, again, um, brings up a whole different series of um, concerns, I suppose, or areas that haven't been looked at fully. Would you like to explain that a little bit to us, Patsy? And even just from the very simple process of going through a drugs test or providing a urine sample to the testers and what that involves? I was particularly involved with one young athlete who ended up going to the 2012 Games and she was referred to me because she was having flashbacks. When she was about six years of age, she had been somehow um, abused by three young young boys in a toilet. She didn't remember, she hadn't remembered much at all, but once she started to be drug tested, um, they, these flashbacks started to, to return. And so I had to query her exactly so that we could work with it, exactly what had to happen. And she had to wait outside, and then when she went in, um, female drug testers were there with her, but she had to pull her dress right up to her waist. And later on, when I queried that with um, some of the people at INSWIS, New South Wales Institute of Sport, it's because previous athletes have cheated in such a way. Um, a young male, he got a flesh-coloured balloon, I put somebody else's urine in it and then tried to pass that off as his own. Um, a female, she also had a balloon, put it into her vagina and then tried to use the urine that was in there. So now, when they're being drug tested, they have to hold their clothes right up high. And this poor girl, she, she had to deal with it and she did, uh, but they also get stage fright and they can't do anything. Um, and they find, some of them find it humiliating, particularly if they have poor body image or they're overweight by normal or look different in any way. So yes, it seems to be a fairly rigorous and for some people very humiliating experience. And there's actually a medical condition now that doctors are aware of where um, athletes, but particularly women athletes, but that some men are feeling it as well, a, a kind of um, neuroses developing because of testing. And, and some people have had to give up their athletic career because they just can't 
deal with this um, anymore. Um, Martin, you mentioned um, at the end of your presentation, you know, what the future may involve, and one of the aspects that um, you certainly wanted to mention was um, perhaps an ombudsman of sport, and I'm just, I'm also a little wary about this because as a man probably known to many people in this room, he is a lawyer, he's the president of the Australian Olympic Committee, um, he's also a vice president of the IOC, uh, he's also in charge of the Court of Arbitration for Sport, he's a very, very powerful man. He also had the contracts written for all of the athletes saying effectively they had to sign over all their rights. Um, and, and he actually suggested also that an ombudsman for sport would be very good, but I just think his ombudsman and your ombudsman may be very different. Yeah, well, so I, ben, ben threw it at me one day when we were talking about... the diff when, Really, when the, the Cronulla case started, I think, back in February, talking about the difficulty of working out what substances were banned and what were. And I think the AOD example is a good example of just trying to get a straight story. So the idea that we had was possibly one remedy or one addition to the system or one thing that could come out of some sort of restructure on the side was this idea of an athlete's ombudsman that could provide that kind of advice and other advice and even representation if necessary or referrals and to do ombudsman-like activities as well. To, you know, there's an ombudsman's case crying out um, at the moment. You know. I think I described it before, the Ombudsman could go in and work out what had happened during this past year in respect of Essendon Football Club and the AFL. These kinds of things um, was where we were really coming from. But one, one of the things that I've learned in sport as an athlete, not a very good one, but also you know, hanging around as a journalist, as an academic and all the other things I've done, is that athletes are never in a position to be able to speak out. Um, and they really need to be given mechanisms to be able to do that and to be given some protection. And, and that was really something that struck home, to, was struck home to me when working in cycling, with all the great sort of changes happening in cycling over the past 10, 15 years, and the different forces at, at play. There have been real opportunities which have been lost to increase the power of athletes and the stake of athletes in, 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 um, in cycling, which have been lost now to this they weren't followed through. But I think that's a really important thing to try and get that. The other thing related to it, I think, is this, ath this Richard made a lot of uh, um, pay of the health ne anti doping nexus. And I, I mentioned the cyclists don't, don't buy into that at all. I don't buy into it either. I don't think, I think the health aspect of anti doping is essentially rhetorical. Um, but increasing if there are ways to bring together health, actually health concerns and anti-doping concerns, for example, using the bio, I've had conversations with WADA, scientists here, USADA and ASADA, about bringing together the biological passport and using it not only as a doping tool, but a health monitoring tool. And they'll go, oh no, that's not our job, you know, we're not interested in that. But it seems to me to be a very easy way to get athletes interested in anti-doping. But if, they're actually, if there's a benefit that an athlete, other than being policed, they might be interested in the system. Mm. But these kinds of things aren't, are never pursued. Uh, this is part of the whole um, discourse of the whole drugs in sport thing as well. It, it's, it's very much one-sided and it's coming from the position of power of the governing bodies and institutions like WADA or ASADA and we, we never hear it from the bottom up. And um, I guess it's... Um, in America, maybe it's slightly different with some of the player unions that are quite vocal um, with the NFL or the NBA, and their athletes, you know, do realise their their power and strength within the game and don't completely sign on to or don't agree to signing on to the entire wider code. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that athletes should buy out of anti-doping and criticise the anti-doping. I just think anti-doping's got its priorities wrong. It's a policing operation, and policing operations are not going to solve problems. Mm. Uh, Tim, you, you touched on this, um, effectively, that the ground now is um, fertile and ready for change. How do you see that change coming about? From, from which <coughs> pressure points do you think it can be most effective? Yeah, I think um, just what you talked about before, Trace, about players' associations or players' unions, I actually think... Um, um, you know, for example, the sport that Martin's referring to the AFL, I think the players' association in the AFL is outstanding. I mean, led by you know, some really good people in 
Matt Finnis and so forth. I think those guys do a really good job in representing the players' interests. Doesn't agree. Um, but look, um, it's, it's, it, but it, the point is it's, it's relatively new. So like, as you point out in America, like, you know, these are long established um, groups that represent the players' interests. And it's not just in relation to you know, something like you know, anti-doping because it's in relation to negotiations of um, you know, broadcasting rights, you know, CBAs and so forth. Um, you know, we are still as in professional sport developing. I mean, we have, if you look at Mary, like sports agency in Australia, it's only up until recent times that accreditation systems have been put in place for our sports agents. Mm -hmm. And I still think that's an area that's, um, that's got room for a lot of growth. I mean, there's, uh, there's quite a number of incidences. Um, people recall Ricky Nixon, um, you know, people like Sam Ayo in the NRL. Some of the practices of these people have been you know, deplorable. And largely the accreditation processes with sports agents um, are not policed well. Um, the sanctions for agents are just a slap on the wrist. So I think you know, there's, there's still a lot of <coughs> room for growth in lots of areas in professional sport. But I do think we are moving in the right direction. And I do think the players have a better voice these days with you know, players associations, definitely. Mm. Can I just ask, is there anyone from the media in the room today? Not really. You're a lawyer who, who pretends to be a journalist. You are. Okay, so I'm not the only dope in the room. Okay. <laughs> I'm always surprised that more people don't come along to this because the great difficulty in reporting these kind of issues is the complication. And Philip, I'm wondering if you can actually comment on that. The issue where doping um, in sport and, and legal representation has become such a specialised area almost existing outside the common framework of law that we know, and that again can be used by the governing authorities, if you like, to say, well, no, it can't go to a normal court of law because they don't really understand. So the athletes miss out on that sort of representation as well. Yeah, I, I don't often represent sportsmen unless they turn up in a criminal court. But I do look on the television and see how it all unfolds before it gets there. And not everybody advises sportsmen the way criminal lawyers would advise their clients when they're involved in the sporting law environment. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, difference but more mainstream criminal lawyers and contractual lawyers are becoming involved in these disputes because they are now so clearly headed towards court more often. Now, I know you've got thousands of questions, so who would like to start and um, just let us know who you actually would like to address your question to or whether it's just to the panel in general? There were lots of questions before. What happened? Here we go. Jason. Um, hi, Jason from UNSW. Um, we talk about anti-doping like it's the only form of drug control available to sport. And anti-doping itself, when you look at the way that the code is written, you must promote anti-doping to the point where panels like the Anti-Doping Research Program will not fund research which could contradict the aims of anti-doping. There are alternatives out there. There's harm minimisation. As much as we don't like the idea of laissez-faire, there is laissez-faire. There are other paradigms out there. I get a bit fed up with everyone just backing around anti-doping and pointing out its many glaring deficiencies. Drugs in sport is a wicked problem. Anti-doping, I think, has reached a point in its evolution where we need to come up with a different way of, of managing the role of drugs in sport and drug control. Given the panel that we have before us, uh, and especially Patsy, I'm interested in your thoughts as someone who deals with this on the ground as an athlete support person. What do we do to make drug control in sport viable, not a wicked drain on resources? Well, the, re the reality is it's tied to money. I mean, we talk about the NFL in America where they have a anti-doping policy. It's only there 
as a public relations exercise. I mean, when you've got a sport that that's, that is that big, that is that self-sustainable, and the amount of money that's in that sport, does anyone seriously think that NFL footballers are adhering to their policies? I mean, if, if every NFL footballer was essentially drug-free tomorrow, you know, we wouldn't see these 145 kilogram, 150 kilogram monsters running around, you know, running 100, 100 yards in the you know, touch over 10 seconds. So it's all tied to money. I mean, the AFL was a sport that essentially was sort of dragged, kicking and screaming in relation to adhering to policies in this country because of, um, in relation to government funding. So that's the reality really when it comes to like um, anti-doping policy. I work primarily with um, athletes who are in Olympic sports. I think more education is good. I did work at the AFL Players Association for about four years as a psychologist, and I was very impressed with their educational pos uh, policies for um, dealing with women appropriately, for gambling, um, and I think, I think if you had policies like that, if you had education, because we found uh, in the Players Association that role playing and having particular types of situations where people could, and I was, I'm talking about dealing with women in certain situations so you, you wouldn't get into the things that a lot of NRL pay, people get into. <laughs> But they, they seem to work. They did work. And I, I'm a firm believer in education. Rather than get a stick, try and educate people. It's interesting you bring that up because, um, Richard, you might want to comment on that. Education was one of the cornerstones when WADA was founded. Um, but that's gradually been kind of chipped away, even to the point now where they say, well, we'll spend less on education and more on testing, you know, more on this kind of catch and punish. Look, education's absolutely vital, and an organisation like ASADA has a very significant role to play <clears throat> excuse me, in conducting education. And it's transformed a lot from doing face-to-face -face programs to having online learning programs that any athlete at any level can access 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the problem is that anti-doping policy today applies to every athlete in every sport. If you're a, um, I don't know, a, an overage football player in the ACT competition, which I am, I'm subject to an anti-doping policy. It doesn't mean that I'll ever be tested, but it does mean that if I buy something on the internet and Asada do pick it up as part of a relationship with customs, that I could have breached an anti-doping rule. So I've got to get education as someone at that level. For an Asada, it's impossible to get to hundreds of thousands of athletes all around the country with face-to-face -face education. So they do what they can with what they've got, but there's no doubt that there's more that needs to be done in that whole education area, but it's not a panacea. Martin? Yeah, I'm not sure that there is any, any anti-doping education done. People talk about it, but I don't think telling people what the rules are and what their obligations are and what they have to do is education. Especially when you can't define the rules. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think that's education at all. And I actually, one of the things, we talked to the cyclists that I did the, the book that I showed before, in that process, we talked about this, to the cyclists about education and anti-doping, and they said, we don't want to know what the anti-doping rules are. We know what they are. For us, education is actually learning about life and giving us some skills so that we can live as human beings. You know, we've been through this factory in Canberra. We get spat out into the European peloton. I'm 19, somebody comes and puts a, a needle in my arm and says, that'll make you feel better. Um, they said, we don't need to be told what the rules are. We need education so that we can live as human beings rather than as machines. So I think anti-doping education is actually about giving people life skills, not teaching them the rules. And I think part of the point where you're going to with all of that, Jason, is the, the sort of hypocrisy that surrounds the whole drug testing regime and, and sport and, you know, where, where the power of sport lies. What, what the panel's done is effectively, effectively re-elaborate that anti-doping is it's money-driven, that education fails, Great, right, we've established that anti-doping doesn't work. Where do we go to next? And, and I guess we talk about the journalists not being able to construct the issue in any other term. We've reached a, he a hegemonic point where we can only construct drug control and sport in terms of anti-doping. How do we get beyond anti-doping to something else? 
And I think this is something when I come to, to legal fora like this, we do get caught up in, in the discussion of rules and oh, let's actually take a big step back and have a look at what is actually meant to happen with this and what do we want to happen. We need to start, I guess, punching through that miasma to get to the next stage of drug control. And if okay, I could, yep. Sorry. If, if I could just jump in on that, um, just, just about the education firstly. I've been involved in developing education programs in anti-doping <laughs> and I've actually attended the clinics that have been put together and it does provide information about how the rules work and how samples are collected. That's a part of it. Athletes need to understand that process. But by and large it focuses on the reason why you shouldn't cheat and the reasons why you should compete fairly and you should compete cleanly. And this is a difficult message to get across to athletes. Um, some will absorb it and some will take it on board. Others will sit at the back of the room and throw paper airplanes. Um, and I've seen both extremes in the different sports that I've been involved in, uh, in, in working in. But just jumping on one other, uh, other topic there, I am a massive supporter in moving away from a blanket approach to testing to a focus on investigations. And the reason that I'm a massive supporter on that is in Australia and ASADA will do seven or eight or 10,000 tests per year across a hundred different sports and thousands of athletes with blood and urine samples. I would rather know from customs or the federal police one trafficker and get their computer for the 30 athletes who are buying banned substances from that one trafficker. Because with that little bit of information, I can find the people who are really cheating, the people who are really distributing, the people who are really importing and not subjecting the 98, 99% of athletes who are doing nothing wrong to the indignities of urine and blood testing, the, the, the breach of privacy of being able to, having to tell people where you are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for the expense of the taxpayer in spending a huge amount of money in collecting these samples for the purpose of finding absolutely nothing whatsoever. There are other ways of doing it. It takes a different mindset. In Australia, we can do that. In most other countries around the world, they don't have this capability, which is why they are so fixated and so reliant and so rusted on with the process of collecting urine and blood samples. Question, yep. Um, I am probably the only journalist in the room, apart from you, Tracy. I'm also a journalist and academic. I'm not a sports journalist, but I'm very interested in um, the relationship between journalism, the media, and moral panic and how that impacts on the public interest. So I want to ask all the panelists a single question. Where is, because I think the previous speaker was absolutely right, the only way that this issue is framed out is in terms of moral panic. Where is the public interest in the, this regime of surveillance that we've created? These are, after all, mainly not crimes, and if they are crimes, they're almost always victimless crimes. So where is the public interest in creating this regime of surveillance and moral panic? Why? Why do we need this? Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I the establishment guy? Huh? You put yourself there. <laughs> Look, um, it is not a criminal offence and we need to keep it in perspective. These are, these are sporting rules. You know, um, you know, whether someone as an athlete has a head-high tackle and spends eight weeks on the sideline, or in the NFL, and I've been a bit critical of the NFL and the NFL Players Association, if you're caught blood doping and using EPO, you get four matches on the sideline. So you get a, a longer ban in NRL for a chicken wing tackle than what you do in the AFL for seriously, seriously abusing performance-enhancing substances. So there's a, there's a divergence. Um, so it's not a criminal offence, um, but and I'm not even going to refer to it as a crime, it's an act. But it's an act that does hurt people. And the victim is the athletes who are not taking performance enhancing drugs, the ones who miss out on being rostered for a team because someone else got the contract because they use the performance enhancing drugs. The victim in the 2001 Tour de France and the 1999 Tour de France. The victim? Well, I think it's a little bit different with cycling because it was, <laughs> it's, it, it was systematic right across the board. It was systematic right across the board. But how many cyclists were there who never got onto a professional racing team because they didn't have the will or they didn't have the way to be involved in using performance enhancing drugs? So it may not be about finding your way on the podium. It may be about finding your way onto a professional team. It may be about finding your way onto an Olympic squad. There is a level where someone made a choice not to use performance enhancing drugs 
where those that did make the choice benefited and profited from it. But isn't that also part of the problem in that the, the whole thing has just been pushed over into a very bad black corner? This is drugs. And immediately when you say drugs, the whole idea is, you know, criminals, bad people making immoral judgments, where a lot of the time what we're talking about is helping people recover um, using the benefit of medicine that the rest of us can enjoy, but now athletes cannot, and yet it's athletes who are putting themselves on the line physically um, to a much greater extent than the rest of us. At the moment there's a proposal that's been put to WADA to ban paracetamol in sport. What? because some scientists have decided that some cyclists get some performance enhancing benefit from them. There's a sort of good thing. No, well, <laughs> well, well, what we used to use, this is me fessing up as cyclists, was the common, just in club races and, and you know, Australian races, match races, there's a combination of pseudoepidrine and codeine or paracetamol. And it's basically what was used in rock and roll, speedball, you know, a combination of heroin and speed. But you feel you go faster and you feel less. So, so it does. You know, all that stuff works. But I don't think it's a, this idea that it's a moral problem is really difficult because, uh, when, you know, some years when I used to do it, it was it was legal. When I hung around with the Garmin team, like anybody anybody who knows a little bit about cycling will know who they are. They're the ethical, clean cycling team. And the year that Bradley Williams came fourth in the Tour de France. Um, pseudoepidrine wasn't banned. So they were basically, the team was basically living on what they called um, pseudoballs or pseudobonds. And, you know, huge doses of pseudoepidrine. Um, and it was legal the next year it was banned. So it wasn't a moral question, it was just a technical question, you know. This morning on the plane on Jetstar in the magazine, I read of all the benefits I could get um, in my fitness re regime of going to an altitude change, you know, one of these places, and it said, it's just like taking the EPO. This is what it said in the Next Star magazine. But that's legal. Yeah. But the EPO is not. Which is part of the whole hypocrisy of, of you know. Well, they're, they're, mor they're, not moral, so they're not moral choices, they're just technical choices. But I think the question was referring yeah, I mean, to but they're yeah, moral panics. panics. Oh, of course they are. Yeah. Of yeah. course they yeah. are. The public thinks it's moral. Yeah, I, I don't think it is um, moral panic. I think it's just a sign of the way law has intruded in the sport across a whole different range of areas. So we're talking about drugs today, but I mean, if you look at like you know, a duty of care, um, if you look at like some of the rule changes that have been implemented in sport, such as you know, bleeding rules and so forth, sports just changed. So what's happened in the past is not going to necessarily be accepted today. And in so many sort of different areas, you know, whether you like it or not, I mean, like, the majority of people here, I assume, are lawyers, and you, and you would think that a bunch of lawyers would support, you know, the intrusion of um, better regulations and, and more law into sport. Maybe not. Maybe it hasn't been a good thing. So, um, you know, I think it's just a sign of the times that sport these days is very, very, um, in many ways, very sterile. And in all different areas, in coaching techniques, in um, you know, administration of care on the field, in refereeing decisions, in broadcasting, the whole list goes on. There's just more and more legalistic sort of avenues in relation to sport these days. Philip Walton needs to leave. Yes, we'll say goodbye. Please thank, thank you. you. Uh, yes, you yes, I just wanted to make a comment. As a, um, I'm thinking of the Olympic Games and how often over the years there have been drug cheats caught and they, that has meant one less medal for that country. Now, right now in Canberra, there's a two-day conference, world class to world best. And they've got some of the top coaches and support people there talking about we want to get up back our place to Rio. We want to be among the fifth top place getters in Rio. We did not do well in London, at London. Now, I, I find, and Richard was mentioning it before, how the um, athletes generally take to the drug testing far more so than perhaps the, I think you implied that, 
than, than um, the footballers. And they're used to doing it all the time. But I'm, I'm wondering if it's got something to do with the public who want these medals, the bronze, the silver, the gold, and whether as a country we're, we're competing with other countries all the time to get more medals. And I wonder why, wonder if that's got something to do with all these rules coming in. Just mm. might be a factor. If I could just, sorry, um, just add one point. Um, I, I think it's really good and I think it's really healthy to discuss where the line should be drawn. You know, in terms of what's banned and what's not banned. Um, because my own experience looking at anti-doping over the last 10 years is a list that was massive and, and unwieldy and had coffee and over-the-counter medications has gradually contracted. It's got tighter and tighter and tighter with every iteration, every, every passing year. I don't think the debate should be about we don't draw a line at all. That's my own personal view. I, I, I think it's wrong to be injecting somebody else's blood to help you compete on the playing field. I personally think that's wrong. But I think the discussion about where the line should be is something... It is. It's, it's not allowed, that's correct, because it's giving you an unfair advantage against my 18-year-old son who I don't want injecting his own blood to be a competitor on the playing field. So debating where the line is... Yeah, but he can go into uh, uh, one of these altitude chambers and get the same benefit. Well, you, and that is legal. Or you, can, or you can inject blood in the 1980s and be a national hero because you've won lots of marathons. Um, but if you do it in... In this decade, you're a disgrace, you know. Hmm. So debating where the line should be, I think, is good. I just think that there should be a line. OK, I'll just get one question from here, and then we'll come back to this side. Well, talking about drawing the line, though, and you say that you are happy for Asada, for example, to move into a more investigatory um, phase rather than focus on testing. And, and it goes to what Tim's saying about the intrusion of law into sport. It seems to me that the intrusion of law in the examples you gave is designed to protect the athletes' rights. Or the, or, or the sport. Or the sport. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All the broader investigatory powers that Assad are getting now under the new, under the new uh, law seems to, and, and all of the focus of, for example, the Australian Olympic Committee specifically eroding or ex excluding the right, not to answer questions if it may be, maybe, go to eroding the athletes. Right. So where do you draw the line in terms of how you achieve the ultimate aim of? Yeah, look, again, I think it's a great question. Um, my, my personal perspective is that there are tens of thousands of athletes in Australia and around the world who are tested purely for the reason that they're athletes. That's the only reason why urine is collected from them or blood samples is collected from them. With the benefit of investigations, it's possible to actually go on an athlete's door and talk to them because their name is on the list of people that a known trafficker of performance enhancing drugs has supplied. So there's a cause to sit down and talk to them. Now the process that takes place after that about what the laws allow and what you need to say, you know, that's for people with uh, a lot more experience and legal experience than, than I. But I would rather be able to use that information in anti-doping to talk to people who really need to be talked to, who really need to answer a question than blanket testing athletes at all levels across the world simply for the fact that they're an athlete. I think it's a, a much more effective use of resource. I think it's a much more effective use of time. And it gets to the most serious problems in sport because you wouldn't knock on the door of an athlete because they bought an extra salbutamol puffer. You knock on the door of an athlete because they purchased some EPO or they purchased some human growth hormone or something serious as compared to something trivial which testing inevitably tends to pick up. The only thing is the creation of an environment of you know, encouraging whistleblowers and there's no protection for the whistleblowers. Do you have a question? Prohibited list of substances. If I'm an AFL player, 
I go to the AFL Players Sports website, all I get is the 2010 prohibited list. If I go and look at the AFL rules, I look at the annex and it's got uh, the 2010. Yet there's another clause which says I've got to find the WADA uh, website effectively and go and look it up there. And when I look it up, I haven't got the faintest idea what it says because I need a pharmacologist to tell me what it is. <clears throat> so I find that in this conference is about the rule of law. It, this is the one fundamental thing, and that's accessibility to the law. If you can't find out the law, it's pretty hopeless. And quite frankly, the athletes in this country, I don't think they can find the law as to whether it was a brave substance. I invite your comments, but I think you'll go back to some of the observations which have been made, is that perhaps the Commonwealth of Australia shouldn't be in sports and medals and all of that thing, because that is effectively just another way of the politicians Paul Barrow yep. buying votes for his sport. And that's where I think it was Prime Minister Hawke who said many years ago, we didn't do very well in Canada, let's spend some money on sport. Yep. And quite frankly, we'd be a lot better off the fellow coming out of the paddock like Cliff Young running from Sydney to Melbourne uh, doing it naturally and Australia would applaud it. So I think uh, we're going the wrong way. So it may be a different way. But I'd like to comment. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll comment on, um, just not in the politics, but um, what Philip's saying about the athletes don't know the law. Um, couldn't agree more. I went to the NRL a couple of years ago with a proposal to fundamentally put in a system to help them understand their playing contract. Because these guys, apart from signing their contract on day one, that's the last they'll see of it. Now, ultimately, when a club or the league is going to sanction a player, how do they do it? Through the standard playing contract. And yet they don't understand it. They fundamentally don't understand the provisions within the contract. Now that's, that's a concern. That's like going to school and not knowing the rules. How are you supposed to behave? So I couldn't agree more with that. And it's just something that's been you know, missed. Um, you know, I support education of the likes that Patsy's talking about, absolutely. But we also need to educate the athletes about some of their fundamental obligations and responsibilities to their club and to their sport. And then we won't get the situation whether it's drugs or whether it's misconduct of potentially players, you know, running around and not understanding their responsibilities. And we're all responsible in life, you know, in lots of different areas. It's something that athletes, you know, don't understand. So I could not agree more.